All right, so this talk's going to be a little bit different, probably. Um, I'm not a real data scientist, so what we're doing is computational microscopy, and it's really this like elegant combinations of optics and computation together to do things that neither could do alone. So it is not just image processing, it's image processing working together with hardware. Um, and I'll, I'll try to explain more. So let me just give you my intro spiel that computational imaging is about hardware and software. It's joint design of imaging systems. So we're systems engineers, we design imaging systems, and our toolbox is different hardwares, which is optics and sensors and such, and also software, designing the software to reconstruct the images afterwards. So I think of this as having two critical parts. First, you have to design the optical imaging system. Almost everything we do is microscopy, you'll see. And so it's about designing the optics for the microscope, not to get a perfect picture at the output of the microscope that you would like to be your final image, but to get information through the microscope. So you've got some thing you're trying to measure X. Maybe it's the 3D phase image of some object that you care about. Um, you put it through a system that can be modeled by some model A, and you take some measurements Y. And then the algorithm's job is to find X given these measurements, right? So this is a nice, simple linear system. We'll see some nonlinear systems later. Most of what we do is nonlinear because we look for phase. Um, and computational imaging is these two things together. So you've got sort of like the black magic and art of image system de design mixed with the more straightforward but also challenging inverse algorithm reconstruction. And usually, we're talking like really large scale inverse problems here. And the whole heart of computational imaging is that these things should work together, that your design process should feed back on itself, depending on knowing what you can do with the software and what you can do with the hardware. So you use the best of each. So I'll give you a, a quick example. This is um, a lensless imager. This has like, been around forever. People talk about lensless cameras. And a lensless camera is a camera without a lens. Take your camera, remove the lens, and take a picture. It doesn't look very good, right? And so here's a question. Can I take this picture? So this is just a sensor pointed at the world. Um, and so I get a big blob. And the question is, can I take that image and reconstruct the scene? It's the same light that would have gone through a lens and hit the camera sensor anyways. It's just been scrambled because it wasn't focused back into its focus position, right? Um, the answer to that is essentially no, practically no. However, if you do something, I'll talk about this system later, but if you put something in front of the sensor, in this case, it's just a bumpy piece of glass that scrambles the light in a different way. Now I get a garbage image, but it's structured garbage. And structured garbage maybe can be inverted. So this is real. We take a picture that looks like this on our sensor and get back this image of our stuffed toy. This is the Thor Labs dog toy. Um, I'll talk about this application a little bit more later. But this is a nice example of computational imaging, where you just have to get the information to the sensor, and then you can solve it in computation. And then we very carefully design this, um, but it results in a very flat, cheap, simple camera. Um, and I'll, you'll see it can do other things. So I want to say that I want to like drive this point home that we are systems engineers. The hard part here is integration, knowing what to put together how. You can't just write an optimization problem for this. You need both the expertise and the optics and algorithms um, to do this. And a lot of what my lab does is pushing the limits of imaging using existing physics, so there's nothing new and fancy or super expensive here, um, and commodity hardware, because we want to keep it accessible. And you'll see uh, a lot of stuff on reproducibility of hardware by using cheap and simple things that can be bought off the shelf. OK, so I'm going to talk about uh, two particular examples in this talk. And both of them represent some key themes from my lab, that we're building scalable hardware. You can make 100 of them without um, blowing uh, your, all your funds from a giant grant. Um, it's efficient. So all, every in piece of information we capture at the sensor means something that has more, a lot of information in it. And we've got some advanced computation in here, maybe not for you guys. Um, so I'm going to talk about these two particular examples. And the first one is this diffuser cam. It's the example I showed you before. It is literally a diffuser, which is a bumpy piece of glass, I said, or it's re really plastic. It's like this stuff that you put on your windows for privacy screen. And you literally just cut this up and put it on top of a sensor. And that's your whole camera. So it's obviously very cheap. We can build them on cheapo cameras like Raspberry Pis. But a lot of the images you'll see are from slightly nicer sensors. Um, 
okay, so that's what the diffuser is. It's just a scattering element, and it's a place a specific distance from the sensor. Um, Grace and Nick work on this uh, with a, a team of undergrads. Um, so the sort of like philosophy of computational imaging is to sort of rethink how we design our cameras. And traditionally, what you aim for a camera to do is to take measurements Y that are exactly what you're trying to image X. And so your forward model, or A matrix here, should be the identity matrix. And people have spent centuries designing fancy optics and spending a lot of money on aberration correction, et cetera, et cetera, to build optics that can be as close as possible to an identity matrix system transfer matrix, right? Um, so with computational imaging, we say, why does A need to be an identity matrix? Well, we had it as an identity matrix before because identity is easy to invert. You don't have to do anything. But if your A matrix is something weird, some sort of linear combination of different points on your object, I would call this multiplexing because every measurement actually corresponds to the linear sum of contributions from different parts of the scene or vice versa. And this kind of multiplexing not only can be handled by using algorithms, you can see in this nice linear case, you just invert A and you can solve for X, right? However, I'm gonna try to show you that actually this multiplexing enables new things. One of them that I'll talk about is compressed sensing, that if you do multiplexing, you have a chance to solve underdetermined problems. So this diffuser cam is exactly a multiplex system. Every point on the scene maps to some like weird combination of measurements in the, in the sensor because every point in the scene gives light to every sensor pixel, or, or most of the sensor pixels. So it's highly multiplex. Okay, so to do this, we obviously need to know this forward model, the A matrix. Um, and we have two choices. So we can either measure it or we can model it. Or we can try to learn it. Um, that I would consider the, uh, the sort of like in-between one. And we thought a lot about this, which to do. So if you measure it, Basically, what I would do is go put a point in the scene and move it across every position in X. So I would just raster scan some point along this scene, right? And measure the measurements for each one and just plop those into the, the columns of this matrix A, right? Um, so the problem with that is that typically our measurements are like five megapixels. So this is a five megapixels by five megapixels matrix. And good luck collecting all of that data, inverting that giant matrix. So I'll. I'll also talk about modeling it, which we've tried pure modeling, and it also has lots of problems because calibration <laughs> is never perfect. Things move. When you just tape a, a diffuser onto a sensor, it doesn't stay where you put it. Um, and so what we end up doing is some sort of combination of the both, um, where we're learning some, we're using a model, but we're learning a lot of its parameters. Uh, so you'll see this as we go. Okay, so just to like, so reiterate the same point. A typical camera maps a point in your scene to a point on your, your measurement, right? That's the whole point of a lens, to copy a point in the scene and make it a point in the measurement. This sort of multiplex camera maps a point in the scene to some weirdo pattern on the sensor. We call this a caustic pattern. Um, and if you take a point source and you put it through a diffuser, at the right distance, you'll get a pattern just like this caustic. This is an experimentally measured, um, uh, what we call point spread function. It's the impulse function. You put a point in the scene, this is your measurement. Okay, so the cool thing about this camera is that when I move that point in the scene, what happens to that point spread function? Uh, well, basically, it changes, good. So now, as long as every point in the scene maps to a different measurement, I should be able to solve this problem. So it's mapping to a different measurement, but it's nice because it's the same measurement shifted, right? And you'll see this one's scaled a little bit. If you have two points in the scene, we get the linear sum of the two. It's a linear problem, wonderful. Um, so uh, the idea that this thing is similar but shifted is super valuable because it adds, adds a lot of redundancy to that forward model matrix. And we need to exploit that so we don't have to take 5 million squared measurements. Here's an experimental version. This is our diffuser cam, and it's me holding an iPhone flashlight, you know, five feet away and just waving it around like this. So what you see is the same pattern just sort of shifts. Um, I usually bring the live demo with me. I just forgot it at home today. Um, it runs on a laptop. Um, but basically, because this is a pure shift, this forward model becomes a pure convolution matrix. And so it's fully represented by a single column. Once you know one column, you know all of the rest, right? So we can measure one point spread function of one on-axis point source 
and fill in the entire A matrix. So this is a big deal, right? And we never actually instantiate this entire A matrix because it's just repetitive. So now you can use FFT operators to do a, the convolution, and you save a lot of computation by doing it this way. OK, so I'm not going to talk too much about it, but it's not exactly a convolution. That's like the first order physical model of what's happening. It's not exactly a convolution, and we deal with this with low rank methods that I'm not going to talk too much about, but I wanted to be like honest about that. So uh, given this first order model, essentially my measurement is just this point spread function. So take one calibration image with a point source far away, and it's that convolved with your object is your measurement, so just do a deconvolution to get back your image. Here's one of the raw sensor images and the picture of Grace with this, her favorite dog. Um, the way we solve it is with ADMM. It's, uh, it's a pretty standard optimization solver with TV regularization, total variation. So the gradient of the image is assumed to be somewhat sparse. TV is really being used as a denoising regularizer. Um, and Halide is this beautiful uh, software by Jonathan Ragan Kelly and Eeks who uh, made sort of like software that can uh, work very optimally with GPUs and such to get optimal performance without me having to be an expert at it. So it all runs in real time on a, on a Mac laptop. Here's another image. Now you know how it works. You can tell me what the image is. This one's much prettier. Um, and of course, it's single shot, which is, means we can do video. You just take a video and then reconstruct it as a video. OK, so, uh, so you can see it's not the perfect camera, right? I mean, like, this is pretty good for like, a piece of plastic stuck to a sensor. But this is not going to compete with your SLR camera. And furthermore, if you think about your iPhone camera, the volume of that camera is extremely small. And so actually, not very many people care about making a flat camera all that much. So, uh, so lest you think this is just a fun lab toy, which it is. It's a fun home toy as well, which is why I don't have it. I forgot it at home. Um, but there's something that this camera can do that a regular camera cannot do. And uh, one of the main things is 3D. I forgot. OK, so I forgot to mention that we have this uh, cool alternate version of it. Two undergrads in my class, Camille and Shriyas, did their, their class project on building one of these with scotch tape. So they put scotch tape on a sensor, took some pictures, and reconstructed them. Scotch tape cam. It'll be open source by the end of the semester, so they say. Um, OK, so the thing that, uh, that we can do that regular cameras cannot is 3D. So a regular camera has a focus plane. If the object is outside that focus plane, it is blurred. Once it's blurred, there's nothing you can do about it. Those spatial frequencies are gone. You cannot get them back. Um, so this kind of camera doesn't have that issue. And I'll explain a little bit more. But basically, the 3D problem is the same problem. You have some object you would like to solve for, except now it's not just this 2D measurement. It's the 2D measurement at every different depth slice that I might care about. And so I just stack all of these on top of each other. So if I have 100 different depth slices, now I have 100 million things to solve for. We actually solve for about 500 million at max. Um, OK, so I can just make this nice, long, skinny A matrix, because I'm still only going to take a 1 megapixel measurement. So there's some obvious problems here. But before I get to the underdeterminedness, there's some even bigger problems. One is calibration. So now I've got 100 million possible positions. OK, so I need every, every sort of like caustic pattern measurement to be different for every position in 3D, which it is. But I also would need to measure 100 million different images to capture this. This would take 34 days um, to capture all of this on our setup. Um, and then I need to invert a matrix that's a size 10 to the 16 uh, pixels, which is insane. So there's probably some data science here who are like, oh, I can do that. And I'm sure that you could. But you could not do that on a laptop. And we're running everything on a laptop in the end. But it's all because of this model. So um, we said like sideways, thing, laterally, things just shift. So we have this convolution model. Here's me moving that point source, or like flashlight, axially away from the camera. So I'm changing the depth of the point source. And what you see is the pattern is essentially the same, but it's scaling. So even with a single measurement of calibration, I can predict these sort of like point spread functions for every 3D position in the volume. And so then I have this very simple calibration scheme that, that maps out the 3D space. So now we've basically solved both of these problems. Great. Now let's address the elephant in the room. This is a severely underdetermined uh, linear problem. 
it's underdetermined by a factor of 100 or however many depth planes you've chosen to solve for. OK, so how do I deal with that problem? This is kind of a game you can't necessarily win, right? But you can circ circumvent it. And the way we circumvent it is going to be uh, with compressed sensing. So think about this measurement now. So the measurement is the point spread function at some depth convolved with the object, plus the point spread function at the next depth convolved with the object, plus every other depth. So very underdetermined. But compressed sensing is going to get around this. And it only gets around it in specific situations where uh, you can make some assumptions about your object. And the assumptions about your object are that your object can be represented in some basis function that is sparse. Um, so how many people have heard of compressed sensing before? Some, not too many. Um, I'm not going to get into the theory or the details. But the idea is that if what you're looking for can be represented in a basis set with 10 coefficients, then maybe 20 measurements is enough, even if the, the um, native basis set has 100 million things, right? If there's only one point source on in the scene, I can figure out where it is. Um, and so the idea is that you can get away with capturing less data or capturing the same amount of data and reconstructing more things. So you can solve these underdetermined problems if you assume that your object is sparse, in, sufficiently sparse in some basis. Here's an example from the 2D measurement setup. So here's our raw image and its reconstruction. Now let me just randomly throw away 80% of the data. So I just kept 20% of the pixels here. And I'm still getting a pretty good reconstruction. Throw away 90%, throw away 98%, and I can still see basically what's going on. Um, so the idea is that this is a pretty good compressive sensing system. Uh, we can get away with uh, solving for more things than we measured. There's no reason to throw away pixels once you've measured them. But in 3D, we need this because we need to solve this underdetermined problem. Um, OK, so uh, our problem looks like this. It's this linear y minus ax. Uh, we're going to put a positivity constraint because we can't have negative light. This is a big deal. This constraint helps us a lot to make this problem solvable. And then the compressed sensing uh, approach is that you add this regularizer here. So this is just a regularizing parameter. Um, and you've got some basis transform, uh, which makes the object sparse. So when we use TV, then we're going to assume that the object's gradient in 3D is sparse. Or we might just assume that the object itself in 3D is sparse. And for 3D objects, sparsity is much more likely than 2D natural scenes. So this is a good, um, a good approach for 3D in a lot of applications. So a lot of what you're going to see is TV. Um, and here's a result. So here's the single raw, raw image that we captured. And from it, we can reconstruct this resolution target. So it's a 2D flat target, but tilted in the third dimension. And this video is scanning through 128 different depth slices. So you see you're getting uh, depth sectioning because you only reconstruct one part of the, the uh, resolution target at a time. Here's another sort of more realistic 3D object. It's a little leaf. So this is a 3D reconstruction, and we're just uh, graphically spinning the reconstruction result. Um, OK, so you're getting more for less. Uh, so where are we going with this? Uh, objects that are definitely sparse. Um, we've been doing a lot of work with people in neuroscience, Halela Desnick's lab in particular, that uh, want to track neural activity in mice. And the idea is that when mice uh, think their neurons, as the neuron fires, it lights up, because they have some sort of magic that makes that happen. Um, and when the neuron, if the neurons light up when they fire, then all you have to do is figure out where that light came from, which neuron the light came from, and you can map out all of the activity in 3D. So you need a single shot method because this stuff happens fast. And so this is a single shot 3D method. And we've made this assumption that things are sparse. Well, thinking is usually very sparse, especially the kinds of experiments they want to do in mouse cortex. So the idea is that. Um, We've already been doing it sort of on a big microscope like this. But what we're doing is taking this lensless camera and just shoving it up against the mouse's brain so that we can do a 3D measurements. Um, the, the brain has a, a, a glass window to the, the skull has been removed. So there, it's optically clear. Um, and we just shove this thing up against the glass window and try to get these 3D activity measurements. So this is something we're working on right now. And the beauty of it being small and cheap and no extra lenses with housing and such means we can just tile a bunch of them sideways and get at extremely large volumes of brain. 
So that's the goal, is to try to image like multiple millimeters cubed of uh, neural activity in real time in a mouse brain. So we, we're not quite there yet. Here's some like prototypey experiments. This is zebrafish, they're just easier to deal with. You can see the two lobes of its brain here. So this is some of the raw data. And we have to take this raw video. We use independent component analysis to extract out all the temporally correlated components. And then we use our, our 3D imaging method to get at uh, which neurons are, are which spatially separated. So we need at least the neurons uh, width of spatial separation resolution, and we have that. Um, so we build up this like giant dictionary, basically, of the measurements at the sensor you would get if you turned on neuron 10 uh, at, on its own. Meanwhile, we can never turn on one neuron at a time uh, controllably. So we have to like, take just like random experiments while these neurons are randomly firing and self-calibrate this thing by trying to like, extract them out spatially and temporally. But that gets us at this big dictionary of measurements, like the measurement you would have gotten for each neuron alone, and where that neuron is in 3D. Um, there's a lot of extra uh, secret sauce in here. We deal with scattering. So it's going through the brain of the, of the mouse, which is highly scattering. And that's all incorporated. It'll come into the measurements as well. So it'll, it'll get into your dictionary. And you can use it as a signal, not as noise. So once you've got the dictionary, then you just run each frame of the video through uh, a non-negative least squares to solve for which neurons are on it every time. So the end th result is that we get these maps of the neural activity in space over time. Um, this is a zebrafish brain. And Hillel's lab is working a lot on, on getting this, uh, doing all kinds of experiments in mice that I don't really understand to try to understand how the brain works. Um, OK, so I think this is actually a super cool direction for microscopy to go because of this sort of compressed sensing approach, it allows us to do something that other systems cannot. And if I think about the most popular fluorescent 3D imaging systems, Confocal is a point-by-point -point 3D scanner. Lightsheet scans a 2D plane. Through focus is obvious, you just take a focus stack. Um, Lightfield takes a single shot, but terrible resolution. So all of these methods trade resolution for speed. If you want better resolution across the same volume, you're going to have to take more data, right? So the acquisition time scales. And a lot of things in live animals are happening in real time. And we don't have time to, to sacrifice the speed to get the resolving power. But we want both resolution and volume over fast times. So compressed sensing uh, with this diffuser cam allows us to have this fast speed and resolving power. That depends on how sparse the object is. But if your object's sparse, you can get huge wins out of this and do things that all of these other methods can never do. And particularly as we go to extremely large scale imaging, by which I mean high resolution across big volumes, so lots of voxels, which is what people want, entire organism imaging, then we need new approaches because we can't just keep adding more and more cameras and expect to collect all this data in parallel at full resolution. So I'm super excited about sort of like this idea of breaking away from scanning microscopy. Let's break this like, connection between the number of voxels you want and the time you need to collect that data. And say that now, my speed scales with the number of non-zero important things about the, the object that I would like to know. Um, so we're pushing this a lot in different directions. Um, and I'm really excited about what this can do for, um, for live samples that tend to be quite sparse, particularly fluorescent samples, because they must be labeled uh, sparsely. OK, so that's uh, the diffuser cam. I want to spend the rest of the time um, talking about another setup. So this one's a lot older. We've been doing this for a while, called the LED array scope. You can see it's like one of the old. This is the oldest infinity corrected microscope that you can buy, because I was super cheap when I got here and bought it secondhand from someone. And the whole idea of this is that you take a regular commercial microscope, and you make one hardware modification. So that hardware modification is that the illumination unit has been replaced with an array of LEDs. Adafruit is literally a kid's toy company controlled by Arduinos. High school kids can program these better than I can. Um, and you can turn on LEDs at will. You can program flashy lights on this thing. So this LED array is just sitting above the sample. This is an inverted microscope. And as I turn on the center LED, I illuminate on axis. If I turn on this LED over here, I illuminate at an angle. So the sample always sees a flat, homogeneous illumination. It's just coming from different directions. OK, um, so here's one of the patterns that we designed. So we flash all these different patterns. And basically, what we're patterning is 
the set of illumination angles that the sample gets. And it's really not obvious why that should be useful. I'll try to explain without too much uh, technical details. Um, but with this single hardware uh, change, by putting this LED around, we can do all kinds of different imaging modalities. I'm going to talk about these two in this talk. Um, but we can get at um, doing things that would cost $100,000 in a commercial microscope with this $100 LED array, um, just by being smart about how we code our illumination and how we reconstruct images in software after the fact. So the first one I want to talk about is uh, my favorite, gigapixel imaging. So this started uh, this is, was started from an idea from a group at Caltech, Chang Hui Yang's group. Um, and we've done a lot to, to expand on it and change it. Uh, and here's a result from our lab. So the idea of gigapixel imaging is that, uh, like disease diagnosis, for example, say you want to find uh, malaria in red blood cells. Red blood cells are tiny. So you need a very uh, high magnification microscope to see them. These are red blood cells. You know, if you want to see some sort of like parasite that's inside the red blood cell, you need, you know, like one micron resolution or so. And typically a, mi a microscope that has that kind of resolution is going to have a very small field of view. This is exactly the same trade-off as a camera. You can either uh, zoom in and get good resolution or zoom out and have bad resolution. You can't get both. Um, and so, so lithography tries to throw money at it, which you can do and you can do better. But there's some fundamental limits of aberrations that don't actually allow you to go uh, to very, very high space bandwidth products. Um, so you always have to choose optically resolution or field of view. But we want both. So if you want to diagnose malaria and you need to see like one parasite inside one red blood cell, which is one out of 10,000 of, of the blood cells, then you need to do this high resolution across a very big area. So we're going to use this flashy illumination to reconstruct images like this that have this good high resolution across a big area, which is not something you can do in a single image with a regular microscope. So this is one of the first images we did. It's about a quarter gigapixel, actually. We, can, we have a system that can do 15 gigapixels now. Uh, they crashed my PowerPoint, though. So here's like my big field of view image. Zoom in on it, and you see I'm not resolving these small features. So we start with the microscope, the cheap microscope that has this, this lower magnification. So the lenses are cheaper on a low magnification microscope. But the resolution is bad. You can't resolve this stuff. Then we flash our illumination. So this is the raw data I collect as I'm doing this illumination flashy stuff. And then from this data set, I can reconstruct the higher resolution. And I can do this on a patch by patch basis across the entire field of view so that I end up with this humongous image at the end. OK, so how it works is uh, probably too much for this talk. It's Fourier optics. Um, how many people know Fourier transforms? Not bad. OK, great. So here's the Fourier transform of my sample. Spatial frequency in x, spatial frequency in y. The numerical aperture of the microscope objective, that's like a key piece of how you choose your microscope objective. Higher magnification microscope objectives have higher numerical aperture, meaning they have a larger bandwidth in Fourier space. So I've chosen the big field of view objective, which means it has a small NA, which means it has a small bandwidth in Fourier space, which means I'm only collecting the low spatial frequencies, which is why I don't get very much resolution, right? OK. So the beauty, and you have to trust me on this one if you don't know Fourier optics, is that illuminating from an angle amounts to multiplying your sample by a phase ramp, which Fourier shift theorem says in Fourier space, everything shifts. And the pupil function of the microscope is the Fourier space. Microscopes do two Fourier transforms. It's beautiful. Um, so essentially, when I, tilt my, when I come in at a tilted illumination, in the end, what I actually measure is this image that looks like this. So I've lit up all these sub-resolution features, but it still has low resolution. So it basically corresponds to this frequency information from the sample. So it's still a low resolution picture, but it corresponds to higher frequency information from the sample. So if I light up an LED up here, I get all of these uh, horizontal edges instead of the vertical ones lit up because I'm, I'm looking at sub-resolution features in this uh, in the, the y direction instead of the x direction. So now you can imagine what I need to do is just turn on one LED at a time. Each circle here corresponds to the Fourier space coverage that I collect from a single LED image. So I'm not collecting images in Fourier space. It's just a regular imaging system. But each of the images corresponds to information from different parts of Fourier space. So I 
collect images from all of these different parts of Fourier space by turning on one LED at a time and taking images. And then I can build up this larger um, bandwidth, which is, this is what synthetic aperture is, stitch everything together in Fourier space. And now larger bandwidth means higher resolution, but I get to keep my big field of view. Um, okay, so then I could just take this thing and take its inverse Fourier transform and get my nice high resolution image. Not so fast. Okay, you can't take the Fourier transform of something unless you know its phase. We measured only intensity and we don't know phase. And so uh, this synthetic aperture idea doesn't work unless you have both amplitude and phase, which we don't have. But actually, we can just write a giant optimization problem that solves both the synthetic aperture, like Fourier space stitching problem, and the phase retrieval problem. The information is stored because of this overlap between the circles. There has to be overlap. We need diversity and redundancy. Um, but once we have it, we can toss it into this big optimization problem and solve for the complex field of the object across the whole giant Fourier space. So we solve for the object. I'll talk later, but this, this P here is the pupil function. It's basically the aberration function. It ruins everything, and so we solve for that as well with a joint optimization. I'll talk about that a bit more later. Okay, so, uh, so now I've said we have to get phase, um, and this is like where my group comes in. This is what we do, is phase imaging. Um, and phase imaging has to be computational imaging. Whenever you take an image, what you actually measure is intensity, which is absolute value squared, of this complex field is x here. So basically, you always measure the intensity at the sensor, which means you throw away phase at the sensor. However, you get this A matrix in here, meaning as long as A is complex in some way, it can move some of x's complex information like phase into these measurements y. The measurements don't contain any phase information from the sensor, but they can contain the sample's phase information, depending on how A maps the complex field of X to these measurements. And we can, uh, we can figure out the ideal me measurements. So, okay, so uh, we need the phase to do the super resolution stuff. But it's also useful in its own right. So uh, most biological samples are like sacks of water floating in water, and they don't absorb any light. So they're completely invisible in focus. This is why people use stains and fluorescent tags, because they otherwise can't see their cells. Um, but there's a lot of samples that can't be stained or tagged. It's toxic to them, or it's expensive, or it, it uh, messes with their biology. And there's a lot of people who just don't want to do it. So uh, if you can measure phase, you can see the cells. So there was already a Nobel Prize for phase contrast imaging for Zernike, was to be able to see these things, because people just couldn't see them before. Um, what we're doing is quantitative phase. So this map actually corresponds to the surface shape and density of these cells. Okay, so uh, we toss it into the, this optimization pro program. It's an iterative optimizer. Uh, basically what we're doing is gradient descent or uh, second order methods. What I wanna say here is uh, how important second order methods are here. This is a very non-convex, non-linear, very large scale problem. We can solve it in patches, so it's not, each patch is not large scale. Um, but what we've found consistently across all phase imaging methods is that second order or Newton's methods for solving that optimization problem, so they use not just the, the gradient, but also the Hessian, which is the second derivative of the cost function. These are actually uh, pretty critical to performance. And I'm not exactly sure why, it's because it's non-convex that, that you can actually get to answers that gradient descent can't. Um, it's possible gradient descent would get there with four billion uh, iterations, but you know, with like uh, with as many as we can go, nothing's really changing here. And we find this pretty consistently that second-order methods just give a better answer. Okay, so uh, in this case, now we're running three seconds versus a hundred seconds, so we're having this trade-off of uh, speed versus accuracy. And here's some of my commentary on why you should choose accuracy over speed. But actually, we, we, what we actually use is a compromise. Because if we did this, then it would just take forever to run these uh, reconstructions on a typical computer. We don't want to go to supercomputers because it makes things less accessible. Um, so we use something that's sort of in between a Gauss-Newton method. Um, so it's quasi-second order method. It works pretty much just as well, but it runs a lot faster. And that's what you'll see all our reconstructions are using. Okay, so now I need to get into some of the dark arts here. This all seems like wonderful and great, but there's some 
uh, there's some issues. So computational imaging, say we have a linear problem. Let's not make it nonlinear to be more complicated. Uh, we always, we need to know this A, right? And we're doing a lot of physical modeling of A. And so you think all you need is the physics and the optical design, and you can predict A, and you can solve this problem. But in computational imaging, we work really hard to make sure that every single measurement is efficient. So because every single measurement is efficient, it means the system is very sensitive to changes in the object, which is good. However, it also means that the system is very fragile, and it's going to be sensitive to wrongness of A. We call this model mismatch. And our optical designs are never what we think they are. Our physics is always approximated at something. Uh, and so the third piece of this like finding A here is that we spend half our lives calibrating these systems. Um, the LED array system has to be very precisely aligned to work correctly. Those LEDs have to be at exactly the angle that you said they were at, or things will go bad. And this is really like the black magic that hurts computational imaging, that by being efficient, we are fragile. And I really think this is why computational imaging is not getting into commercial products, because people uh, have some super expert spend four hours aligning the system. They take the beautiful pictures for the paper. Somebody sneezes, and it never works again. And so uh, I have this sort of like thoughts on reproducibility. We want to make these simple, easy systems. If they only work when like my one grad student aligns it with his piece of duct tape and wire, which is really how that we started aligning these things, um, then it's not reproducible, and people can't adopt this, right? So we went to address this problem of calibration. Um, and we wanted to address it in a way that is accessible and reproducible. And the way that we're going after it is what I call algorithmic self-calibration. So uh, we started out sort of like intuitively. We know what's wrong with A. It has aberrations, so our system has aberrations that are not accounted for. And those LEDs are not coming in at exactly the angle I told you they were coming in at, sometimes because the LEDs are not placed properly, sometimes because uh, the sample itself has a refractive surface on top that's in inducing sample-induced uh, shifts in the LED positions. These are the two main problems. And before we s calibrated these out, this is the reconstructions we were getting. So like, what's the point in doing super resolution if everything's ruined by bad calibration? OK, so where we went with this is that we want to, we, we're not going to learn A completely. That's like too much. It's not going to be possible to learn the whole thing. But we can learn parameters of A. And for now, we're like manually or expert-wise picking which parameters of A matter. It took us a long time to decide these were the two that mattered the most for the reconstruction quality. But now we've got some parameters on A. So now uh, we can parameterize our calibration. And Regina hates calibration. So she wants to solve for both the object x and this calibration parameter phi. And the, the, more you can, the fewer parameters you can have, the easier joint estimation this is going to be. But this is just a joint estimation. Solve for one, solve for the other. You can actually prove that it will not diverge. It may not converge, but it will not diverge. And in practice, as long as the data is diverse and redundant, it will converge. Um, OK, so we do this. This joint estimation is happening through all of the images I showed. They would look like garbage without it. And now I don't need to pre-calibrate and then nobody sneeze. I can do the calibration from the data itself, which makes everything much more robust and accessible. Um, so uh, here's an example. This is just a phase test target. So it's like a piece of, of glass that has very specific heights. And we can get these heights to within a couple nanometers correct. So we take our low resolution raw image, looks like this. Our super resolved phase image, it's correct to within a few nanometers. And part of the reason why is because we also jointly solved for the aberrations in the image. So I said we do this on a patch by patch basis. If I look at this patch, these are the aberrations. If I look at this patch, I get different aberrations. Optical systems have spatially variant aberrations. Now we can solve for the, the spatially variant aberrations. And particularly in low resolution, like cheapo microscopes, that have really big fields of view, the aberrations are bad, and they need to be corrected. OK, so we're using that through everything. Um, the last piece to this is that we wanted to look at live samples, and everything was just too slow. One LED at a time was too slow. Things are moving. So we started designing the coded illumination patterns. And that's where you saw this sort of disco pattern video. This is a pretty carefully designed illumination pattern to uh, maximize the information with the least number of images to reconstruct the object. 
So uh, originally, because of all this overlap, we were having about 10 times more data collected than we had reconstructed. So things worked uh, by virtue of having a lot of redundancy. And with this pattern, we can get really close to one-to-one -one data collected to reconstructed. And so that means we can start doing live stuff. These are cancer cells. And if I zoom in, this is the resolution you would get with an ADX. This is the field of view and resolution you would get with an ADX objective. We're getting it across a few millimeters. And this is a cancer cell dividing. It splits into four cells in a quantitative phase map. So it curls up in a ball and then splits into four cells. Uh, and so because this is quantitative phase, we get maps of the volumes of all these cells. We can segment them all and figure out their dry mass. This is just using Cell Profiler, which is a popular uh, open source software. And then uh, biologists can go and extract whatever information they want about the cells from this quantitative data. All right, so I'm not going to spend too much more time, uh, but we also do all of this in 3D. So similar to the diffuser cam, we can just also solve for 3D from the same data sets. We need to keep more of the redundancy because we're solving for more stuff. So it's not compressed sensing now. We're just going to collect more data. Uh, it amounts to basically being a giant neural network in which we're solving for these nodes, but the nodes are what we want. The nodes are the, um, the amplitude and phase of this 3D object um, that we're after. So it's basically like, it's like a neural network, but all we do is the training part. And once the training part is done, the weights on the nodes are our final answer. That's our, our 3D image. Um, there's some really nice papers. This is similar technique, but there's some really nice papers that sort of like point to the idea that this is the same. And essentially, our big optimization algorithm amounts to a big um, neural network with the number of layers here is going to be the number of 3D depth planes that you're after. And this is the number of pixels in 2D. So this thing is huge, right? Um, and we basically just do a backpropagation. It accounts for multiple scattering. That's beautiful because every, every voxel talks to the other voxels because the light scatters from one voxel into the other ones. Um, it's highly nonlinear, very non-convex. Will it converge? We weren't really sure. I'm still not totally sure. Um, but we can get nice pictures sometimes. Um, so this is, a, uh, this is a slightly different technique. But we're getting the 3D phase map or refractive index map of some embryos here. You can see like two on the top and two on the bottom as I scan through the depths through this movie. And uh, this is something that we're actively working on because this algorithm is much more fragile. We're, using, uh, we're trying to solve for a lot more stuff from the same data. And uh, it's not always going to work. So uh, designing how you collect the data to make sure that you uniquely reconstruct all of those uh, coefficients is very difficult because it's a highly nonlinear problem. And multiple scattering makes it even more nonlinear. So uh, we, we linearize everything and can show that if it were a linear problem, we would be collecting exactly the right data to uniquely solve the problem. But it's nonlinear, so it's possible that we're not. In practice, that seems to work for the design. But um, we're always looking for people with smart math ideas for sort of doing these designs and inverse problems more, uh, more like theoretically accurately or being able to prove that we're getting a unique solution. So that's all I really had. I think my, my sort of outlook here is that Computers and optics should talk more. I think this is a nice example where domain science and data science are working together um, smartly to do things that neither could do alone, um, and just to extract more efficiency from existing systems. Um, and I think there's a lot to be done in imaging to uh, use what we have better. Um, and one of the big themes in my lab is to make all this stuff cheap and simple. This is something I like simply won't negotiate on with students when I want things to be cheap and simple so that like Joe Schmo biologist could build one of these things in an hour in their lab, get it working, and not need my grad student to go and tell them all the little tips and tricks to get it going. And we're really moving in that direction in a lot of our projects. So I'm pretty excited about it. A lot of this stuff is open source, um, or uh, people are working on different things with other groups. So the last piece that I'll, I'll mention is where we're going is that we're doing gigapixels per second now. That's basically our camera's frame rate limits our data capture rate. But we're starting to think towards terapixels per second. We've got some awesome hardware th things with uh, multiple sensors working together to collect tons of data at once. We're starting to think about like what you can do uh, if, if you have this kind of like data throughput. So we're trying to get as much as we can out of the least data, but then let's also get more data. Um, and thanks a lot to particularly my group and all our funding sources. <laughs>